Welcome to Exploring the Scripture Readings for Sunday's Liturgies, Session B, 3. Welcome to the third Sunday of Advent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. One of the events that we often see at times of celebrations are processions. And processions, and these processions, sometimes done at night, for instance, a procession at Lourdes. People walk carrying candles. In the dark, it's a wonderful way to see where the people are moving, lights up the way, but also has a certain feeling like it really represents the people. It represents light coming into the world. So now we begin our third Sunday of Advent, and it's our light coming into the world. During the Sundays of Advent, I've been using an example from the lighting of the candles on the Advent wreath. Today, the candle is pink. We've been lighting purple candles. The symbol of the pink candle is rejoice. That's the theme of our liturgy today. Rejoice. And the idea, it's a calm kind of rejoice. It's a little bit of excitement in the air now. The birthday of Christ, the celebration of the birthday of Christ is drawing near. And so it's Rejoice Sunday, a time to realize we're on a journey, but a little encouragement reminding us what's the purpose of our journey. Our purpose in this journey is to prepare the way of the Lord. And so that's what we'll be celebrating today preparing the way of the Lord. So as we go into the scripture readings, the scripture readings speak about light coming into the world. And so we keep that theme in mind, a theme of joy. Joy, not, not an exuberant kind of joy, not an overwhelming kind of joy, but the joy of knowing that the celebration of the birthday of Christ is near. And so we'll take the theme from the gospel. And it begins right away by saying to us, a man named John was sent by God. He came for testimony to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. So what it's really saying to us is that we're now going back to the beginning of John's gospel. We've been reading from Mark's gospel, but suddenly now comes the message from John's gospel. The purpose here is that the church is teaching us a lesson each one of these Sundays during our journey. And so today we learn the lesson of joy, and it speaks again of John the Baptist. We spoke about John the Baptist last week, but now the theme is a little bit different. And what happens is John comes now as someone to testify. He's not simply a voice crying out in the desert. Really what's happening now, he is now come to share what Christ is saying. So he comes as a testifier. He gives testimony. And also he testifies to the light. The light. The theme again of John's gospel is light versus darkness. So it's the light that comes into the darkness. That's Jesus. And John, the author of the gospel, speaks about the light of Christ coming into the world. So it's very fitting when we speak about Christ, the light coming into the world, we light a yellow, a uh, pink candle. And the pink candle now reminds us it's drawing near. And then the gospel goes on to talk about the testimony of John. A little bit different. 
he doesn't come as one as part of the light, as part of bringing a certain kind of testimony to the world. He's going to be a person who is giving us testimony about the coming Christ. And so he's really the person who is a presenter in a way. That's the theme. The theme is it's a Sunday of joy, subdued joy. A chance for us to look back and say, well, how am I doing so far? How well am I preparing for the birthday of Christ? How do I keep Christ central during the season of Advent when there's so many distractions, store windows, stores, everything is speaking about Santa Claus, Frosty the Snowman, Red Nose Reindeer. Where is Christ? And that's what the church does. The church is saying, keep in mind <laughs> the old saying, the reason for the season. So we go back to the book of Isaiah, first reading for the third Sunday of Advent. And the first reading is meant to give us a background, a background to what's happening, what's coming, the preparation. So from the book of the prophet Isaiah, we've heard this before, but now it begins, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of the Lord, God, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Back in ancient times, around the time of Isaiah, that what was happening is kings were anointed, prophets were anointed. But now suddenly the follower in the case of Isaiah, he's the one who's anointed. It's not any kind of anointing ceremony. It's the idea the anointing comes invisibly from God. So the Lord has anointed, has chosen me. So the spirit of the Lord is upon Isaiah. The writing from Isaiah, this is what they call third Isaiah. As I mentioned several times already, first Isaiah chapter one to 39, that was written with the real Isaiah in a sense. Isaiah who, started to talk about the preparation. Babylonians are going to come before the exile. Second Isaiah, 40 to 55 chapters. What happens during that time, they're in exile. They're now talking about life in exile and the hope that comes from exile. Then in chapter 56 on, we now read about that time in Israel. And during this time, it's a time of preparation, a time of building, a time of joy, and a time of sadness, a time to confront what they now come back to, and a time to know they have to rebuild. That's the joy. But there's still the oppression as they look around and see what's happening. Well, we light our candles on the Easter at the candles. I uh, like Easter wreath, Advent wreath. Well, excuse me, I didn't mean Easter, I mean Advent wreath. What we do during that time is that we're preparing for the birthday of Christ. It coincides several of the days with Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a Jewish feast, a celebration. The people have come back into the promised land. And in the promised land, they rebuild. They rebuild the temple in a sense of rebuilding what's in it. They bring it back to its original state, bring it back to God. It's under the time of Judas Maccabeus within the second century before Christ. And what happens at this time is that now they have finally done this. They're going to rededicate the temple. And so they rededicate the temple with great ceremony, great joy. Usually in the civil calendars, it goes from December 15th, the evening of December 15th. It'll go, excuse me, December 7th to December 15th. And so they celebrate this and each day they light a candle. The candle is symbolizing the changes, the progress that is taking place. They've dedicated the temple, and now it's time to rejoice. Rejoicing is not just that one week. 
it's a, excuse me, that one day, it's a full week. So it's happening now. They light the candles. They're celebrating that. This is their Hanukkah. Their joyful rededication of the house of God. And every year they celebrate that. And so it happens during our Advent season ordinarily. And so the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord has anointed me. Isaiah now is speaking about the rebuilding period, not Hanukkah itself, but the period in which Hanukkah took place. And so he's able to go on and say, he has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. As we light our candles, we hear that. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. We are not just in the spirit of Christmas in the sense of saying, in the spirit of buying and giving gifts. We're in the spirit of Christ's deep blessings, preparing us, reminding us what a tremendous event the birth of Christ is, reminding us the reason for celebrating is that the birth of Christ has happened. So now what happens, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, not just to say, well, look how wonderful we are. Every time the Lord gives us a blessing, it's usually a blessing for us to move into something better or different. So the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. So I bring good news to the poor. You are not alone. You have Christ. You have God to heal the brokenhearted, to bring God's blessings into their life, to think about them, be concerned about them, to proclaim liberty to captives. There was something that said that each time in, in the ancient Israel, Israel era, they were what was called a sabbatical year. A sabbatical year took place every seventh year. And so on the seventh year, they were told to be kind to each other in a sense, to let the land lay fallow, not to plant anything during this time. And also to be a time of forgiveness of all debts. It was a time of being kind to the poor. Proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, and announce a year of favor from the Lord. And so the year of favor from the Lord, a day of vindication by our God. So it's a day of vindication. God is part of that celebration. So the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. It now applies to us. The Lord has sent uh, uh, me to bring glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, free them from whatever we can free them from, to release to the prisoners, and to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God. That's the first part of Isaiah's prophecy. But now comes the second part. Again, when I talk about prophecy, realize not only is he speaking about something in the future, but he's speaking about the seb, the present going on into the future. I rejoice hardly in the Lord, Isaiah says, and my God is the joy of my soul. Rejoice, and God is the joy of my soul. For the Lord has clothed me with a robe of salvation and wrapped me in a mantle of justice. Imagery. Poetic imagery, as though the Lord gives us a cloak called salvation to put around us. It embraces us, covers us fully. Like a bridegroom adorned with a diadem. What Isaiah does here, he compares the salvation of Israel to be like a bride. A bride who's adorned for a wedding. Israel is now brought back to the Lord prepared again as the die as the bride of Christ. In Isaiah's day it was the bride of God. So Israel is coming back to God. They didn't know about Christ yet. Like a bride bedecked with her jewels. 
and the earth brings forth its plants. A sign that God is with them. They've now come back into the promised land. And in the promised land, what happens with them is that they begin to plant. And in planting, everything begins to grow. A garden makes its growth spring up. So will the Lord make justice and praise spring up before the nations. So what I say is saying here is that the spirit of the Lord is upon Jerusalem, upon the Israelites. But also we apply it to us. Everything in the Old Testament applying to the people of Israel is meant to apply to the new Israel. And so that's the idea. The spirit of the Lord is upon us and we rejoice because what happens is God has robed us with goodness, kindness, love. God has put around us a cloak of salvation. We're sharing in salvation. And so we rejoice. It's time to rejoice. So we light the pink candle. Then we come to the responsorial psalm. The responsorial psalm says, my soul rejoices in my God. The responsorial psalm is really taken from the hymn of Mary. The hymn of Mary when she goes to Elizabeth. What happens in earlier times, Hannah proposes a hymn the same way. It almost sounds the same as Mary's Magnificat. But really what's happening is that now Mary comes, she shares the idea that God is working through her. We repeat Mary's words, apply them to ourselves. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. This is the responsorial psalm. For he, the Lord has looked upon his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. Not because we're proud of what we do. It's because we've been blessed. We've been clothed with salvation. We have the robe of salvation thrown around us by Jesus. Trying to really understand what that means is takes a great deal of meditation, a great deal of reflection. What does it really mean to be special to God, to be saved? To say God is not only thinking of our life here, God is thinking of our life on into eternity. That's really what Advent is about in many ways. It's always looking forward to the birthday of Christ, yes. But looking forward to our day, birthday into eternity with God. But during our life, we can look, God has touched us. So we continue with Mary's Magnificat. The Almighty has done great things for me and holy is God's name. God has mercy on those who fear God in every generation. So Mary's prayer now becomes our prayer. We repeat the refrain, my soul rejoices in my God. The Lord has filled the hungry with good things. The rich, the Lord has sent away empty. They thought they had everything. But when the time comes before God, they find out they have nothing. The Lord has come to the help of his servant Israel. All of us, really, the new Israel. For the Lord has remembered the Lord's promise of mercy. The Lord promised this. And to realize God's promises are not simply something fickle. If the Lord promises that we shall respond, uh, he will, the Lord will bless us. If we respond to the Lord. And it's going to happen. And what we try to do to the best of our abilities, to be as good, loving, perfect person as we can, and to rejoice. Religion should bring joy. Joy is different from happiness. Happiness means, oh, everything's wonderful. I'm smiling all day long. No. Joy means a fulfillment, a feeling of contentment. The idea... I trust God. I trust that God is blessing my life. So he has come to the help of his servant Israel. For the Lord remembers 
the Lord's promise of mercy. God is always merciful. To take the scripture seriously, it says mercy covers a multitude of sins. The idea being, if we show mercy to as many people as we can, it covers a multitude of sins. Scripture says that. Now we come to the second reading. The second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. It's the first letter that Paul wrote. And so Paul is now writing to them. He sees himself as bringing good news. Paul is in prison here. So Paul is writing from prison and it's kind of strange. It looks to him like, well, I'm in prison. I don't know when I'm getting out. But he writes praising them and rejoicing with them. Brothers and sisters, he writes in his letters, rejoice always. That's why we call it Rejoice Sunday. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. That's the foundation of joy. To pray without ceasing. We can't pray all day long. The idea being we have things to do. We get distracted from prayer. We can start praying, but somewhere we say, well, when did I stop? The idea is we're human, but let our whole life be a prayer. Offer our day to the Lord. In all circumstances, give thanks. Even when things go wrong, give thanks. Rejoice in the Lord. He's in prison. He's rejoicing in the Lord. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Not that you should suffer, but that you should be able to respond to suffering with a reflection on God's presence in your life. To know that you're not alone. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. Sometimes in our life, we begin to think, well, this is what should be happening. We see, for instance, even our present Pope, so many times he's criticized for being merciful. And yet at the same time, he's saying, even in a book he wrote, the name of God is mercy. And in another way, he says it, the name of God is love. To him, love and mercy are the same thing. The spirit is at work. Do not quench the spirit. The spirit keeps drawing us to be more and more merciful as life goes on, as creation goes on. Do not despise prophetic utterances. So realize God has given us all these messages. God is mercy. That's a message. That's prophetic. But what are we doing with that prophetic utterance? Test everything. It doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to go ahead and say everything good is good. No, no. Test it. Discern what God is saying. Listen to what God is saying. Be a person who can hear the word of God and at the same time realize God is always pulling us forward, pulling us into understanding the world, understanding God's message in the world. But at the same time, not to do it in such a carefree way that we forget about God's love and God's mercy. Test everything. Retain what is good. So after we discern to realize what is good, what is not good, according to God's plan. All in all, refrain from every kind of evil. So he's telling us every circumstance, give thanks, but this is the will of God for us in Jesus Christ. Do not quench the spirit. Let the spirit guide and work, work in our life and realize that we're going to be hearing from God. We don't know we're hearing from God, but we're going to. Be. And at the same time, when we feel we're inspired by God, test it. Make sure it doesn't hurt others. Perhaps see if it fulfills God's mercy and love for us. May the God of peace make you perfectly holy. So Paul is now praying for the people. So after saying all of those things, a little bit of a idea of how to live their life, May the God of peace make you perfectly holy and may you entirely, spirit, soul, and body, the fullness. In ancient times, they separated the spirit from the soul. And in many ways, if we understand how that works, the soul is life. 
The spirit is how we live life. In ancient times, that's the way it came out. And the body is what we do with it externally. Spirit, soul, and body. We're meant to be preserved blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Looking forward. We're celebrating the days of Advent. We're on our journey. And we take this joyful rejoice always. Christians should be joyful people, not sad people. There's a lot of sadness in the world, a lot of pain in the world and suffering in the world. We can have that pain and suffering with others, but still within us, we can have a certain joy, a certain courage, a certain strength, a certain belief that God is with us. So the one who calls you is faithful. So the Lord, he's praying, is, is, is one who calls you. Lord is always faithful, no matter how bad things get. God is always present. And to live by that thing, thought every day. And so no matter how bad, no matter how much suffering we go through, we can say, God, I, I know you're here. It's difficult, but I trust you. And Lord, he says, we'll accomplish it. The Lord will give us the courage and the strength that we need. Now we go to the gospel. As I mentioned already, John has come. John gives testimony to the light. He's going to tell us. He's going to point beyond himself. He's, he's going to give a testimony. In John's gospel, it's basically light overcoming darkness. So we'll start off now. He says, this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him, to ask him, who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Christ. Back in John's day, people saw how popular he was, how others came to him, how others changed their life by being immersed in water. They made that commitment themselves. John didn't make it for them. That was their commitment. And so to show that they made this commitment, it's something internal. They went down into the water to show others and at the same time to receive help from the spirit. So they committed themselves. But now they saw how popular John was. And they began to say, are you the Christ? They had these questions for John, even on into the early church. There were some who believed he was the Messiah. When the authors of the Gospels write this part of the Gospel, they make sure to show that John is not the Christ, to allay the belief on the part of many, thinking that John was the Messiah. But no, here explicitly John himself is saying he's not the Christ. So they ask him, what are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? So we can give an answer to those who sent us, as though they're not looking for the answer themselves. Tell us who you are so we can bring this answer to others. What do you have to say for yourself? And John now answers. That's John the Baptist. Now we turn to John, who is the name given to the author of the gospel, John the Evangelist. It's not one of the apostles. It's someone who is speaking from the community of John the Apostle, a community that built up and was nurtured by him at the beginning. But it is not John the Apostle. He would be deceased by the time this gospel was written. So here's what John the Baptist says in response to those who want to know who he is. I am the voice of one crying out in the desert. That's a change from the synoptics. They talk about a voice crying out in the desert. Here, John is saying, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. That's his mission. So he's called, and as we all are, we're called to share God's message, as Isaiah the prophet said, he said. He's taking Isaiah's words and applying them to himself. 
some Pharisees were also sent. But all of these ideas, the Levites and the, and the Levites, the priests, they represent the people. The Pharisees even represent the people. So all the people are asking John, uh, why then do you baptize? If you are not the Messiah, why do you baptize? And if you're not the Christ, he said, no, are you the Christ? No. Are you Elijah? Earlier, when they ask him, they'll say, are you Elijah? He says, I am not. Elijah was the one they expected to come again. In the prophet Micah, we read about Elijah coming again. In the scripture, we read about Elijah being carried off into the sky in a, in a chariot. And he really doesn't die. And so they wait for Elijah to come back. Are you the prophet? In the book of Exodus, we read that one like Moses will come, a prophet like Moses. Are you that prophet? No. And so now they say, well, why do you baptize? If you're not Elijah, not the prophet, why are you baptizing? John answered them a very important answer for John's period in the early church. I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. John sees himself as so unworthy that he can't even act as a slave to the one who is to come to Jesus. An interesting part here is that John does not say he will baptize you with water and the Holy Spirit, as we read in last week's gospel reading. He simply says, this person who's coming after me is greater than I am. He's pointing to Jesus. He's saying, you think I'm so great. You've put me way up there. But the one who is really way up there in the minds and hearts of the people in creation is the one coming after me. He's greater than I am. And it says what happened in Bethany across the Jordan this happened where John was baptizing. It's not across the Jordan, not the Bethany right across the Jordan where John seemed to be in, near Jerusalem. It's another one, but they really don't know where that is. But the idea behind it, a man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony to testify to the light. John the Baptist had a mission to testify to the light, to the coming of the light into the darkness of the world. When we say darkness, we mean a world that up until the coming of Jesus was really said according to the scriptures to be struggling against sin, struggling against the power of sin. Finally, the Savior came and brought the light of Christ into the world. So as we read this third, the readings from this third Sunday, we read, it's a time to rejoice. The celebration of the birth of Christ is drawing near. The celebration of the birth of Christ means that a new time is coming. We're clothed in salvation and we wear the mantle of justice. It means we're meant to be a reflection of Christ by our way of life. And so as we continue on our journey, we have a little breather this week. The breather is saying, keep in mind, see how you're living Advent so far spiritually. And then reflect on why you're celebrating it. And now there's still a little more to go on your journey. So now, as I said, we light all three candles, two purple, one pink. There's one per candle left to be lit on our Easter candle. I, excuse me, I keep saying on our Advent candle. May God bless you all. May the light of Christ lead me. The power of Christ be with me. The wisdom of Christ inspire me. The word of Christ instruct me. 
the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me, the depressed find hope in me, the weak find strength in me, the doubters find faith in me, the rejected find love in me, and the world find Christ in me. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.